All righty, guys, we are live. I am here with the myth, the man, the legend, Tom Crutchfield. My goodness, I'm so excited that you're here. Um, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing really well. That is wonderful to hear. Um, so this interview has been a super long time in the making because, like me, you live in a wonderfully rural area and you just didn't have the broadband to do this in the past. So I'm so excited that you've gotten upgraded. Yeah, my daughter finally found a way to get some additional uh, coverage here. You know, but mm -hmm. only about a year ago. So up until that time, anything live was just wouldn't work. Well, I'm uh, so go ahead and drop a line in the chat, guys, if you can't hear either one of us, and we'll try to fix that. But it's sounding really good to me over my headphone. Um, so for for people that don't know who this man is, he's one that I consider to be kind of the founding one of the founding fathers of our reptile industry that we have today. So um, I love hearing stories about the old days. Do you mind sharing some stories? Uh, just basically start back as far as you can remember. Just tell us anything interesting about your childhood or when you were a young man. Um, you want to, what, is there any particular animal you want to hear stories about? Because there's so many. <laughs> um, just whatever comes to mind. Anything, I mean, how did you, were you allowed to keep reptiles as a kid? Tell yeah, us about it. Well, well, how it started actually is, I mean, going back to the beginning, is I found one time at my house in the side yard a ring next snake under a rock, and I was five years old. And I was absolutely just flabbergasted, you know, because I was a dinosaur fan already as a kid, you know, and, you know, any, any kind of wildlife I like, but especially reptiles, alligators, and the like. And it went from there, and I went from, you know, uh, having people in my family not wanting me to have reptiles to allowing me, even getting uh, two baby alligators, real alligators, for me when I was 10. And I actually raised those up in my yard until I was 18 years old. Wow. Uh, they, were, they were babies when I got them, and my mother was a waitress, and one of the customers that had been out and killed a female alligator and got some <clears> babies, <throat> and he had them at the bus station, and and my mother bought a couple from him to give to me because the Cayman I would buy would always die in winter because we had nowhere to be anything in North Florida. And uh, finally, when I left home, which I did at 18, I, uh, I gave them to Ross Allen. And they were eight or nine feet long. And so wow. it just, and I was allowed to have venomous snakes from the time I was 16. Uh, but I can only keep reptiles outside, not inside. So, uh, what species would you say you were most fascinated by as a teenager? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I love them all for what mm -hmm. they actually are. And, and it's like with relationships you have with people, each relationship is a little bit different depending on how you mesh sort of. But I would, I mean, crocodilians have always been a love of mine. And at one point I actually had a crocodile farm and was lucky enough to have 19 species and was even able to capture breed 10 species. Wow, uh, that's amazing. Including Cuban crocodiles and a lot of other really rare ones. <laughs> so uh, I probably at the beginning loved those the best, but probably now I would have to say it's lizards, particularly iguanic lizards and varenos. Amazing. I mean, man, I am learning so much from them now, and I don't have any, any uh, more big crocodilians like I had. You just have. I, I think there's three pivots for scopobrosis that work came in. But even those require really big habitats, like 15 to 20 feet long, really. And they, they don't require, they'll live in a small, like, closet size thing. But mm -hmm. it's not really fair to them because these are highly intelligent animals. Just as intelligent as, as, as particularly crocodilians, as dogs and cats. So, because they're, they're actually, I think, certainly the most intelligent of all reptiles. But then again, yeah, I agree. Birds without feathers, anyway. You know, all, if all, I mean, they have a poor shape of heart. They have, they're birds without feathers. The other reptiles are not. Yeah, it's definitely amazing when you interact with these animals. So um, there are more and more studies being done on whether or not 
animals can have intelligence and have relationships with people. And I think that the people that work with them know definitely some of the facts behind that. What do you think about that? Well, what I think about that is I think that reptiles, the cognitive uh, abilities of reptiles far surpass what most people know. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, they definitely have emotions. I mean, I have a big, uh, uh, I, I have five free roam sakura in my yard. And they are separated from each other by fences because there's three males. They would definitely fight. You know, they used to fight when I let them climb over the fences to each other. And then the one that climbed over would climb back to his side. So I finally put some out of the And uh, they, they're intelligent enough to know where they live. They're intelligent enough not to leave the property. Mm -hmm. uh, they're intelligent enough to come when they're called. They play with toys. Um, uh, Stacy had it. We can only have, uh, I only have about two acres here, so we can only have crocodilians up to four feet long. Mm -hmm. Stacy had raised one alligator up to that point named Squirt. And Squirt lived outside here in the yard, you know, like a little marsh area, uh, mm -hmm. maybe 80 feet by 30 feet. And it had a pond and it had like a little trail and another trail going there. Which, so he had to go out of his pond and go this way and come up for Stacy to feed him. And so Stacy was giving him alligator chow on a paper plate. And the first time he spilled a lot of it, trying to get it off the plate and eat it because he can't get down in the water at the right depth and all that because that's not mm -hmm. where he lived. Second time she fed it on a plate, picked the plate up in his jaws, took it back over to where he lives without spilling it or dropping it in the water and put it down. Wow. I, watched, I watched a friend of mine with a, with a crocodile, just an American crocodile, living in his backyard in Tavernier, Florida, in Florida Keys. And this video showed it had a half floating plastic bag of trash. And then the other side, his side has a seawall, but the other side had mangroves, and he had a boat ramp going down. And this big crocodile pushed that half floating bag up on the boat ramp, you know, where it goes down the water, pushed the half mm -hmm. in the out of the water, and then sank back to the water for about three feet and submerged. It set up a, a, a trap, an ambush, and baited it. Think about it. Whoa. I mean, I, I have films of this alligator taking the plate, too, by the way. Uh, wow. Our big crocodile monitors. Uh, people say they make a mistake in bites. You know, they don't. All of these accidental monitor bites. What happens is you're holding your hand. I don't know if you can see my hand or not. That's how. Let's see. Sort of. Okay. But anyway, what happens is once the monitor targets the, the food item, if you involuntarily snatch your food and you see this big mouth coming at you with the mouth mm -hmm. open, almost everyone does. Guess what the monitor is going to do? It's going to stop the prey from escaping and you snatch it away. And that hmm. means warning to stop by the, the accidental bite, not an accident at all. Interesting. I, have, I have videos with um, lizards, turtles, including alligator snapping turtles. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Sakura, uh, and, and even some of the snakes that we train past their uh, 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 snakes are the hardest to, to to train or anything in terms of feeding because they bite first and ask questions later. Mm -hmm. they, take, they take their prey from a distance, as you know. In right. Nature. Most other reptiles don't. They're very up close. But that monitor is you know, exactly targeting everything, you know, not python or whatever. So you have to get them past that that bite first. But once you do that, you can train them. I trained that giant blue tick I sent you the picture of. Mm -hmm. I have videos before and after of her trying to kill us when you went in. And at last she'll come out and just have her head sort of straight up, you know, for us to handle the rabbit. No kinks, so you know she's not trying to grab it. Wow. I, I can send them to you when you get up months ago. That retic was massive. How much do you think she weighed? She weighed exactly 181 pounds with no food in it. Wow. And she was right at uh, 16 years old. And about That's 18 years old. It incredible. Was wild. It was caught wild up in um, Cutler Bay. And the Florida Wildlife Commission dropped it off here about 2009. It's probably about nine or 10 feet long then. And I stopped selling big giant snakes even back in that time. Mm -hmm. Big one or something special, you know, no babies, none of that. 
And, uh, I, and this was sort of a medium size one at the time that nobody wants. But we just kept it. And the next eight or nine years, it got really good. And I, I just really wanted to take for other things. And so I found another home for it. It's great right now. Oh, nice. Yeah, Greg's amazing. So you started keeping venomous as a 16 year old. What, uh, at what point in your career did you start traveling abroad and doing all that amazing stuff? Uh, that would be uh, in the Caribbean mostly at the beginning because I didn't have the money or even a passport for that matter to go anywhere. But at that time you could go like in the Bahamas or, or Haiti or uh, a number of places throughout the Caribbean and you didn't need anything but just a, a driver's license like him right. you know, like that, or Mexico, you could go to Mexico the same. So a lot of people out west were going to Mexico and hunt rattlesnakes and stuff and really what I wanted to see were the West Indian boas and the, you know, and the sakura, the rocky ones. So I spent my early years exploring the Bahamas and went to such remote places as uh, Elutra Island, Great Abaco, Bimini, the Ragged Islands even, the Zumas, uh, San Salvador, and later years, um, all over. Haiti, I made probably eight expeditions to Haiti in the 1970s and early 80s. Wow. Most, Jeff Schrock went with me on the first trip, I think, 1974. And we drove from Capicien, or rather from Puerto Prince to Capicien on the north coast. It took us 13 hours, 180 miles. And when we got to Bonaire, there was no road anymore, just a dirt road. And we had to slow across the mountains at night going into Capicien. What a trip. So was the purpose of those trips primarily to find animals and collect animals at that point? Yes. Things I wanted to keep. What I was trying to do back at that time, point in time in history was to travel to weird and exotic places, catch animals that I knew existed there and that I had interest in, bring them back, and bring back enough so that I could pay for my trip. And be wow. able to go place else. Otherwise, I couldn't afford to keep the animals. I have to sell them because I'm taking money out of the household. Because it's not like, I mean, I was working at Sierra Club for years. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like I had a lot of money. So things are a lot different now with the internet yeah. and with the with the reptile industry being uh, almost like mainstream. Also, back in that time when I started, keep in mind, there were no laws, there was no sightings, right. there was no permits, there was none of that stuff. You could go to Haiti and, and bring back 24 rhino with one of in a big box and nobody cared. This is really why it's smuggling because really they, they just didn't care. Mm -hmm. We didn't even hide. Them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people didn't necessarily value the native wildlife. A lot of them were considered pests. Oh, they and everyone. yeah, Same. so um, I mean, the animals that you were bringing over, pro some of them probably had a better life than some of them in captivity. Although well, husbandry yeah. was. Yeah, we can justify it like that, but no matter what, when you're taking an animal out of nature and putting it in captivity, while it does have a better life in some ways in terms of predators, etc., would you rather be in a cage your whole life without anything ever happening to you except the same thing all the time, or would you rather be free? I'd rather be free. I think they do right. too, but I think to be honest with you, the good that it does and then did to bring all that stuff in. Uh, back when I started, everybody hated any kind of reptile, but especially mm -hmm. if it was a snake, I don't care what kind it was, if they would shut anybody, everybody, uh, it, it, it didn't matter. And, 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 and everyone told me, because I had such a fixation or obsession with reptiles, that I would never make anything out of my life at all, and I would have to, mm -hmm. I would find that out sooner or later. And uh, there just was a small amount of people that even had an interest, and now, with bearded dragons and, and all, all the bearded dragons in captivity, all were smuggled in. Mm -hmm. I smuggled 100 of them in myself. Right. I bring them through, through Switzerland or Sweden. Right? And uh, they just were, uh, uh, they came from Australia to another country. They're not sightings anything. So once they got there, they just be transshipped to the US. Somebody smuggled them in Europe. They were legally cleared here, even though they were through the poison tree or illegally obtained. But it's been like that with so many of the animals we haven't heard mm -hmm. about. 
with that. But overall, it's been positive, I think, rather than negative. Because one thing is sure, any of that shit that was smuggled, ain't nobody going to Australia to try to catch bearded dragons to smuggle out. Because you can buy them for $15 here. And when I was in Australia last time in 2012, 13, mm-hmm. they were $125 in Australia. Oh, so, wow. Forever. That's amazing. So I'm sure that this was kind of like uncharted territory with you going out into the wild and finding these animals. Tell us about some scary experiences that you had, either with the animals or with native people. Well, probably with native people, there was a time that they, that a guy named uh, Al Swartz, uh, a couple of other authors, they uh, reviewed the entire West Indian boa genus then that was a picker piece, now it's Chilobathus. And um, they had discovered several new species or subspecies. And one was this faded out looking patient boa that lived in the Tiburon Peninsula. Tiburon means shark in the Spanish. Mm-hmm. And that's that little, like, southern, like, little string that sticks out at the bottom of Haiti. And there's a town at the end named Jeremy, which is the capital. So I knew these things came from around Jeremy from the research and stuff. And I'd already been to Haiti two or three times. So I said I was working for Sears. And I took my two-week vacation. And one of the salesmen at Sears went with me. And we took off and... Uh, uh, and we went to Haiti to in our intent was to charter a plane, fly down to Jeremy because you couldn't drive the road for a passage to go that far. So it was either boat or plane. We found out we could we could hire an amphibious plane and land in the water and 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 go up and then they come back and get me in two weeks. So we did. So I shouldn't say we did, we we I did, but uh but after it took about two days to set it up, and I had my guy, Chris, and, and, and Raymond, too. And Bob and myself were there, and we were in Puerto Prince. And we just got off the plane, and I noticed when we got off the plane, Bob looked absolutely sh- like stunned. I didn't know why, but until later. And then we, uh, and, and remember when you go there, Haiti is a black country. So, I mean, thousands of black people. I mean, that's all. Mm-hmm. You go to Pajon Bill. Which I love. He was from New Jersey and was terrified of black people, which I had no idea before. Why would you go to Haiti if you're afraid of another race of people? That's the stupidest thing I ever but we did. So, <laughs> so we get out in the countryside, and this was the worst part. Well, first of all, we go to the restaurant close to uh, uh, to the hotel we were staying at, and Randy and I walked inside and we looked out the window, and there's Bob, and he's got a moment on each arm, and his, his, his arms are full of. Uh, Carvings and stuff, and I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, maybe we should buy this. He was afraid not to buy it. I said, put that shit down, come on in here. So to make a long story short, he got so freaked out, he flew down early, early and flew back out to the US. But I flew down there, and that was a really wild place. There, there was really no passable roads in that time. So so we would go out by donkey and we rented this. The whole town didn't have any roads, so they brought me in cars at the time. And there was a lot of motorcycles and bicycles. But once you got out of town, there were these trails, but there were no real roads. And we rented this Jeep with the driver, but the Jeep was in really horrible condition down there. And, and, and we went out and we went back to this real remote place near uh, It's a place called, near a place called Kempery, R-R-I-T-N-P. And it's not so far from Jeremy on the map, but it's a long way if you try to drive there. And we went through markets that I had never seen anywhere before, except in Asia and Africa. And well, after at that point, I'd never seen open air markets with, you know, skin like cows and stuff, parts of them, flies, and nothing that we see here, you know. So everything's mm-hmm. different. But right. We it's all processed. And- correct. And when we passed in this one village, I noticed there was a boy and he was taped up and tied up, a young man, uh, maybe like 14. And he kept yelling at me, blanc, blanc, blanc. He made me smite, and that's. I don't speak Creole, so I didn't know what he was saying. So I, I finally asked Fritzner, I said, Fritz, what's he saying? He says he is going to be the goat without horns. And uh, and he wants help. I said, what? He said, the goat without horns. I said, what exactly is 
the goat without horns. And if you look it up, if some someone listening to this, if there are, there are people, they could look. There's an actual word for it, but it's a human sacrifice where they take the place of an animal in Bordeaux. And Bordeaux, we call it voodoo, but it's really Bordeaux. And uh, Bordeaux is, not, is pretty much a good thing for the most part. It's like Christianity or any other religion. They want good things to happen to their neighbors. But in the, in the, in the, in the good Bordeaux priest is called Bunga, and the evil in the, in the priestess is called the Mambo. But there are also evil black magic voodoo priests called Bokor. B-O-C-O-R. You Google it and see it. And they're not nice. And, uh, so anyway, uh, he kept saying this, and I did not interfere because I didn't really know what was going on. But he'd always bother me. Did they really kill that kid? Wow. I, don't know. I never knew. Hmm. But we did get, on the good side, I got eight of those new uh, uh, boas from, from TV Rock. Uh, at that time, they were Picker T. Stratus, uh, Exagitus. And there had been never been a living one brought into the U.S., only the whole type of paratops. And I also got at that point a uh, Picrates Marcellus Capillus. And I got a pair of those. And that's the only ones of those that have ever been brought into the U.S. Hmm. So that was a cool trip. Well, I had a lot so, of cool trips. I hate even that one. So husbandry back in those days was very primitive because some of these animals were coming into captivity in our country for the first time. So tell us about some of the species that you kind of worked with initially before we had any information about it. Well, the main thing was supplying UV light and all that kind of mm -hmm. thing. We didn't we didn't have access to UV light up in the sun. Right. Until they made a thing called Vitalite, the Steinhardt Aquarium published in the Kazoo yearbook that's put out. And said all the benefits from the uh, from the white light. I, we never knew that existed, so we didn't use it. But we did understand by looking at the animals that the animals need to be a lot hotter than what a lot of hobbyists think today, or we have to heat up more. So we were like giving them basking spots of 140, 50 degrees mm. based on what we observe the lizards doing. And you know, I we need keep, I need to keep them long term like I do now and stuff. But we didn't really have a huge amount of problems. You know, with them you can or anything back then. And we had giant snakes, but if you look at all the old pictures of the giant snakes, they ain't no shit about giant snakes. Right. And because giant snakes were giant snakes. We figured they needed giant damn cages, and they do. Mm -hmm. A giant snake is one of the most intelligent snakes in the particularly retics. Retics are unbelievably intelligent. Mm -hmm. They really are. And, and they understand, they know, and, and they utilize. And, and I've studied wild ones and all that, and they utilize every bit of their habitat. A 20 foot retic will climb up to the top of a tree in a heartbeat. That giant one I have, easy. Wow. Uh, they, they occupy all types of habitats. And at certain ages, they live in certain places doing certain things. They have Cochran did in Thailand with that video of the retics in the trees and jumping mm -hmm. out of the water. I, I wrote about it in the book I wrote on giant snakes, the same thing. Yeah. Was Oh, in Malaysia, they jumping out of the palm trees, so, you know, in, in the palm swamp. Yeah, that was, yes. uh, I wrote about another incident with me in, 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 uh, in Pirat in 1988, you know, where I saw the same thing. And they were all the same size, fashion, four feet long. And they were all really basking or in ambush. Uh, hmm. uh, but we didn't see any other sizes right there at that spot. They might have been some, but, but there were lots of those sort. And they have complex social structures. Um, I, I, uh, I, I'll give you, um, I, I published a paper on the kids at the IHS in the year 1980. Hmm. And the, the title was Territoriality of Python Articulatus. Hmm. Which it, it's, you can read it still. I mean, it's a bad I'm going to look for that. It, but this paper, I kept, I lived in a mobile home then, and I, I had one pair of kids because that's me, that's all I could keep. You know, <clears> it was a big room. The 15th, and I put uh, newspapers and uh, stuff all over the floor. And I read, uh, I did the windows with the screen wire, heavy welded wire and stuff. And I made shelves in there and a pool where I could pour water out with a cattle tank thing. And I put a big pair of chicks in there, male about 14 feet, 16 foot female. I acquired another one that was supposed to have been a female. I didn't check the sex, I should have 
Today I would have known it was a male but just how it looks. I can tell second you take almost across the road. If mm-hmm. it's got eyes on it, you know, just by how the head looks. But mm-hmm. uh, but uh I didn't then and, and I put him in that night. And then when I woke up in the morning, it was like the It looks like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre had been filmed in there. Oh there no! Pattern on the walls in both of the retakes. It looks like one would grab the other one like that, and they would twist its head while the other one pulled the thing. And they had these lacerations that were like machete cuts. Oh my so gosh! The back, it took over one thousand stitches to sew the two snakes up, and they both lived. And of course, I separated them. But I didn't know that that would even happen in nineteen, and really that happened in nineteen seventy seven, but it was published in nineteen eighty. But I gave the presentation I think in seventy eight at Knoxville, Tennessee. But wow. Again, but uh, uh, but 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 the point is back then everybody still kept snakes in big cages, and mm-hmm. it makes that's really what they need, and it's a big problem for us in public culture because we're being attacked for it more and more, and we can't defend that because. It's really a defender. They're huge. So, I, I mean, wonderful, though. They're all, all, I, I can't imagine my life without the ticks. You know, I've had them my entire life. I love them. I, love, I love the way you have everything set up at your place right now. It's um, because you're in Florida, you are able to have all this tropical stuff outdoors year round. So you have very large, lush, natural, I would say naturalistic, but they're actually natural enclosures. It's not fake plastic plants. It's actual little ponds and, um, you know, trees and and flowers, all kinds of beautiful stuff. So um, tell us, because you're obviously, um, as you've had more experience, you're definitely of the mind that that's preferable or I, or ideal for animals uh, rather than the, being. In a, I, yeah, from the animal standpoint, mm-hmm. from our standpoint, it's a lot harder. Right. But there's more. And even inside, like I had mine leasing the room, but you don't have to. If you go in my room with the Manchan Vipers, when I used to have them in the big eight foot fishing cages, I built a big wire cage that sits four and a half feet off the floor. It's 18 feet long, five feet deep that way, with four doors, one on the end and one on the side on both. Mm-hmm. Divided in the middle where I can open it and let them come and go or block them okay. off. That includes two of the windows to the outside, heavy wire, that the sun comes through. Mm-hmm. And that cage is 18 feet by five feet by eight feet tall. You can put a huge pipe in that cage, but you can't put 25 pipes in that cage. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That side and stack them where they're like, they don't have any room. Right. Just, I mean, I know everybody does it like that. It's industry standards, but it's just not right for snakes. It's the snakes. I think everybody ought to have the ticks. I, I, they're, they're one of the best pet snakes you can have. Um, tell us about some of your safety protocols that you have at your place, because obviously you've had a lot of dangerous, dangerous animals, pythons large enough to kill a man, venomous stuff. So tell us what some of your um, just average safety protocols are. What kind of tools you work with, what your rules are. With venomous snakes, we always had three rules. And I had very few venomous snakes and bites and my businesses or me in my entire life. Myself, I've only been bitten three times by a venomous snake. Twice through a bag and one strike out of the cage. It barely hit me. I've never had to take any venom ever. Mm. Worst bite I've ever had was from the crocodile monitor when I put a net on it because they were fighting. And I was by myself to break the fight up. And when I put the net on it, she tore through the net, turned around and gave me a warning bite. Which oh, crippled, man. Which uh, crippled my finger for life. That's as far as see how. Mm-hmm. It's just it's wow. Crippled. And I don't have feeling. Uh, and, and that's another animal that, that needs an entire room size cage, too. Uh, you can't put crop monitors in business cages, or they're going to hurt somebody for real. Mm. Anyway, the tools we used, uh, we use regular snake hooks. Uh, I rarely use tongs here. We never use gloves. In fact, Vanessa jokes at it because well, we call them bitch mittens with gloves. The reason we don't use gloves is that I can't get the tactile support that I need mm-hmm. unless I have my hands on it. But what we try to do everything too is what we try to do 
to avoid getting hurt is to not scare the animal. And I think that's something that all of us hobbyists could do. And I'm a hobbyist too, even though I've done it as a profession. I still started as a hobbyist, and that's where I feel like I am. It's like everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 it, it's just the fact of not scaring them. You know how when a snake's going in the cage, and you'll see the private person, especially the venomous, they'll punch his tail with a snake that's to make a club tail in, and then the snake spins around always. Every time mm -hmm. you're scaring it, and you're making it more likely to try to pretend against you next time you pick it up, and it'll bite you. Right. So we'll, or try to bite you. So what we try to do here is to make them not want to hurt us. That's our biggest safety thing of all. Mm -hmm. So with the snakes, I have three rules here. First rule is you never, ever open a cage with your hand. Hook, whatever it takes. If okay. it's a sliding glass, you can hook and put it on the thing mm -hmm. and open it. Never reach in to get anything out of the cage, like a dead rat or a right. water or dish or mm -hmm. without taking that animal out of the cage and securing it and then doing it. Because don't ever think that you can do it faster than that thing is right. Mm -hmm. I promise you, you can if it's serious about it. So, and the third is don't handle them behind the without unless you have a lot of training there's times you need to do that and it's pretty safe if you understand but if you don't really understand you haven't had training and it's your first time or second time that's whenever you have it behind the neck it's when you're the most likely to get bit by so hmm. i want to caution for that but that's the three main rules right there just i mean opening the cage with your hand is a big deal. Uh, yeah I agree. And, or even like standing too close, like you said, you yeah. use a tool. That's how, I I, that's how I got it on the hand. I was standing too close. And, mm. the the one, and I misjudged it, the distance the snake would strike. I, mm. I messed up and it cost me the money. So yep. what were the, what were the three venomous snakes that bit you? I got bit. The first bite was a, an Osage copperhead. That a friend had sent me up in Alabama uh, to, to Birmingham, and I picked the shipment up. And there was not supposed to be venomous snakes in the shipment, to be honest. Mm. And I didn't know there was. And I picked the bag up without taking precautions above the knock, and it popped me on my finger. But I didn't go to the doctor. It swelled up and turned black. But... Wow. Did you have what? So that that was it? Did you? Was it how painful was it? I was pretty painful. Really painful. Wow. I, mean, I, I mean, my finger was black and swelled up like that big. And I got big blood bubble things on the side of my oh. finger. You know, but it, it went away, though. Wow. Okay, so uh, oh, what then, was... No, that was the first one. The second okay. one was, was, a, was a, a huge, captive raised West African green mama Ooh. that had been sent to me by the Milwaukee Zoo. Hmm. Uh, I'll never forget that. Ken, Ken Kanata or something like that. A friend of mine had sent me because, and this thing was in a, a, a big bag that had been knotted and tied, but below the knot, they had put a wire and wired it shut to mm. so it just don't caution. So I take the bag out and sit the bag down, holding it above the knot, and I take my other hand and start to twist the, uh, the tie the, wires. Stick, the wire so I could get and undo it so we could take the mama out. And the mama saw the movement through the bag, and the bag had enough slack in it. Mm. That it struck, bit me right on the palm of my hand, a full body. But it had injected the venom as soon as it bit the bag, which was probably six inches from my hand. And the whole bag was wet. But by the time it hit me, I, I didn't have any reaction at all. I went to the hospital, but I didn't need any. Wow. And then I got hit here by a Crotalus pyrus, or, uh, uh, stuck around the snake, which just struck out of the kitchen. Wow. But we need to bring you a snake hook. It's like everybody for the most part, nothing really special. Do you have a brand that you prefer? No, I mean, I've used them from a lot of people. Uh, Chris Woodcock makes really good hooks. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, John Ziegel's passed away now, but he used to make good hooks. Uh, and I've had them from other people. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, that the bigger company that has the hook price. Uh, I can't think of what. Is it I, tongs.com is where. Uh, that, I get a lot of my stuff good. from Dana. Yeah, Tonks.com's real good. Yeah, so I <clears> yeah, they're really good. I think we have Tonks. We have Tonks here. We just never use them hardly. 
uh, other than for food items or something. Right. Yeah. The hooks. Yeah. We use hooks, tongs, um, yeah. the locking buckets good. we get from them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They got, they got really good merchandise. Excellent. They even, they even have um, a, a venomous snake emergency kit that has a compression device. And so I was like, well, I'm not, I'm not really sure about this because, um, you know, you, you see those. Band, like, like say you got a bit by lap and you just put a tight band. It's it does so slow it, the band down a little bit, I hear. It's it not, it's not a um, tourniquet. It's actually a compression device and it was right. devised by an ER doc. So we actually had an Atrox bite at our place and used it and it worked really, really well. So um, we sell them now because that uh, it was amazing. It was truly amazing. He got life flighted to Lubbock. They were so scared because they didn't have very much anti-venom where we were. And they kept that compression device on him until he got the anti-venom. And some of the nurses were saying like, oh, he was, it wasn't really a venomous bite because he doesn't even show any symptoms. Once they took it off his whole, so it was on the hand, his whole arm swelled up within 20 minutes and they were like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe that worked so well. Yep. It was, Same thing it was wild. A friend of mine in Africa, but he had to, uh, well, I don't know the guys didn't say that, but a friend of mine wrote the account of an Arno Nod. This guy got bit with a black mamba in the bush some hours from the hospital. No any venom or anything. And a big black mamba bite can be fatal in a very short time. Oh, they yeah. They put on this, this compression bandage like you're talking about. They do that mm -hmm. spray. And he made it to the hospital with symptoms but not life-threatening. Right. The minute they took that off, they had to intubate him. And he was like, it was like it made up for lost time, you know, with the North. With the, wow. I, mean, I, I believe they, 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 they definitely work on it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And actually was based off of the compression devices they do yeah. use in Australia because there's so many venomous snakes. And, you know, it's like how many hundreds of miles away are you from a hospital? And so it was and then it was adapted for the military. And now uh, tongs.com sells them for twenty dollars and it's reusable. Uh, that would be a great uh, thing to have. Uh, uh, one more thing about venomous snakes I want to say to you. When I was younger, I kept anti-venom as much as I could for as many different mm -hmm. things as I could because we have so much stuff coming in and out. My daughter, Vanessa, said she's the only kid she knows that the entire vegetable crispers in the refrigerator were full of anti-venom. But, <laughs> I, I, but I, buy, I buy all the stuff from Thailand of different kinds, the polyvalent from South Africa back then, and uh, uh, the Australian tiger snake. The tiger snake's what we got from Australia because it was good to save a life for a lot of the Latin bites. It, it, it may not be as effective, uh, in mm -hmm. terms of, uh, but it'll keep you alive until right. something else. So we always wanted to have some of that. And we had, you know, the, the South American anti-venoms too and all that sort of thing, various coral snakes. And uh, the weirdest one and the hardest one we had to get was the, the uh, Echis anti-venom from the Pasteur Institute in uh, Paris, in France. Mm. Uh, but I would recommend anybody that keeps, and what I'm saying is about anti-venoms and why I brought it up, one of the things I should throw in about safety with venom snakes is that if you keep exotic venom snakes, you need to get a specific anti-venom for the species you keep because mm -hmm. the life you save might be your own. Right. That's People sure. don't realize that there's different types of venom and different types right. of anti-venom. And that some snakes, there are no types of anti-venom for them yet. However, like you can use an anti-venom for crotalus for many species of crotalus, and it's pretty effective. Well, the reason for that, though, it's a sort of a polyvalent, too. You know, they mm -hmm. make it, like a lot of that in that Mexican stuff, uh, Mexican. Uh, I'm trying to figure the name of it. Anab 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 uh, it's made of multiple kinds of crotalus and mm -hmm. all just together. Right. So it, it's all, it, yeah. But another interesting thing, too, like, like the cobras in Sri Lanka, the Indian cobras, mm -hmm. same species in India. Any venom in India works good for the ones in India, but it doesn't work at all for the ones in Sri Lanka. Interesting. So you get by that, the only anti venom until recently they had access to was the anti venom made in India. So people hmm. would get better Sri Lanka by a, uh, a native cobra and just die with anti venom because it's not the right kind. That's just wow. backing up what you 
were saying earlier. I'll give you an example. Uh, another is if you have monocle cobra uh, antivenom, for instance, and you try to use that on, uh, uh, let's say, a cake cobra, now you maybe it's probably not going to be very effective. Mm -hmm. you know? So you want to make there's... sure you use antivenom. It's a lot of trouble, and, it is, and it's expensive a little bit, mm -hmm. but you know and it doesn't last forever. So that's something you have to consider. I have people contact me and say, hey, I want to start keeping venomous. What do I need to do? And so one thing is that there is an additional expense with the additional safety protocols that you have to take. If you spend a lot of money on anti-venom, you have to make sure it's the right kind. And if you're going to keep a diverse collection, you'd need multiple kinds and that it doesn't last forever. So if you don't use it, it does expire after. It's like medicine. Yeah. Yeah, but on the good side with the antivenom, and we've, we've done it here because we've used some, not mm -hmm. now, but in the 80s, and mostly in the 80s, that was over 10 years old and had expired. Wow. It was, it, they're life lives. Hmm. And they were still effective. Really? But That's interesting. We couldn't count on that, though. It's right. Just that the ones we had were effective, but I don't know if that would hold for every kind of antivenom or not. And another thing that people don't realize is that different people, depending on your size, your genetics, all this stuff, two people can take a bite from the same species and you may react very differently. And also a lot of animals can control how much venom they deliver based on the size of the threat. There have been actual dry bites where they don't deliver venom at all and others where you know they it'll definitely be a fatal dose so just because your cousin joe bob got bit by something and he was fine doesn't mean that it may be that way for you so i think people hear one story or or read one account or hear one video on youtube and kind of think that they have a good encyclopedic knowledge and people need to realize that that can be highly variable it, it, it actually is very it's really variable now, let me say one more thing, too, and I should have brought that up when I said we, we should get your own anti-venom, too. Before, when you get these venomous snakes, even if you get local venomous snakes who stay at the hospital, have anti-venom for it, mm -hmm. go in and just talk to the emergency personnel. Tell them what you have and make sure that they know how to respond. Because right. the amount of time it takes, too. Let's just, uh, let me give an example. Mm -hmm. it, we're, we're a, we have a very small venom lab here where we produce uh, uh, life-wise venom from about 100 monocle companies. It's bought by one pharmaceutical company for EMS studies and for some products they make with, with some of the, the enzymes and stuff inside the venom to fractionize it and use. And the guy that does most of the venom extractions is Ray Hunter, who you know, used to work with Bill Haas. Right. Of, so mm -hmm. anyway, he, he's a self-immunizer. He has... You know, pretty much immediately. I've seen you get bit by King Cobra and not even care. And Monocle Cobra's two or three times. But the other day, he was milking one and he turned sideways in his hand and bit him on the thumb. And he knew he was going to have problems with it. Uh, not that it would kill him like, or any like, life threatening, but what it causes is the tissue damage. The cytopoxic part, mm -hmm. that ain't, um, that's a problem. That'll run its course. It won't be life threatening, but you might lose, you know, your hand, foot, whatever. So we have antivenom here, so we go into the hospital with the vials of antivenom. Well, they didn't want to give it to him. Uh, so they called Venom 1, finally got Venom 1 over there, and they gave it to him immediately. You know, well, not wow. immediately. It took a couple hours for him to get there. But what if you were in a hospital and they didn't want to give it to you? You waited 12 hours, you could die. So you need to talk to them ahead of time so they don't right. think you're a crackpot when you come in there. Mm -hmm. well, you get bit by, I got bit by my cobra, here's the antivenom. Eh, they're going to look at you like Crazy as hell, right? Know. And then you have to start calling people to get treatment, you know, mm -hmm. so that they have someone. And it's just a place. I've been involved in two or three of those bikes trying to save people's lives mm -hmm. uh, with hospitals. The last one was in, in uh, actually in Birmingham, Alabama. And she got bit in the stomach by an Eastern Diamondback rattlesnake. Mm. And uh, they kept putting off giving any venom. And she's having these metallic taste in her mouth and all that Oh, stuff. my gosh. And I think she's going to die. Well, she, my girl was short. She was never the same. Uh, she, uh, she passed away from COVID last year, but not. Mm. The rattlesnake bite bit her in. And, 
And and I got on the phone and trying to get them to give me the antivenom six hours afterwards. We still hadn't got it. And uh, I didn't even know about the body first. And they didn't do it. And I mentioned a, a, a Dr. Ben Abo, who is pretty famous here in Florida mm-hmm. uh, with uh, Venom One. And, uh, uh, he, he's a medical doctor, uh, and his little speciality is venom snake bites. And so Ben Abo happened to be this doctor in Birmingham's. Uh-huh. Uh, he was in some of his classes. So the minute I mentioned that name, he sort of stopped being. He knew that you knew what was going on. Right. And I gave him Dr. Abo's number and had, I had asked him already and, and, and they gave him the antivenom. It was all right. Wow. So that's why I'm saying you need to go down there yourself to, to protect yourself. And yeah, your that's family, you know, a good point. All that help. That's a lot of help. For me. Not know what's going on. You heard no, about the be- by two up in the northeast. Yes. I mean, that was he, he came really close to dying over there. Lucky so, they found um, I, I'm sure you've heard of it. There are a small community of people out there that keep venomous and they milk their snakes, usually not in a, any kind of sterile manner, and self inject venom for different reasons. Some people think that they are going to gain super strength from it or magical powers, but most of these guys are wanting to build immunity. Um, and the two or three people I know who were doing it were not doing it hygienically. So, I mean, infection for one, you have to think about. Um, and also, too, with a bite, like you were saying, even if the venom isn't, you know, necessarily life threatening, there's always a risk with any kind of bite of infection. So um, I wasn't a huge proponent of the people who I knew were doing it, doing it. Do you have any um, <laughs> opinion on self-injection? Well, personally, I, I know of a half a dozen people that at least or more that have done that, including Bill yeah. Haas, I knew real well. I wouldn't do it personally. I never did it. I never felt the need to do it because I felt that that my understanding of reptiles and how to be a tree. Mm-hmm. I always tell people how to be a tree. They don't bite trees. They don't crawl over you. And if you hold it and restrain it, it becomes a different snake. So, I mean, I can literally go out and pick up wild men on the snakes. If I take a lot of time real carefully in a very short time, be able mm-hmm. to just let you know what I mean? They just... They, they stop trying to bite if they stop feeling threatened. So it's not the understanding. So really, I guess for all your question, the best way to answer it, the best and most effective safety precaution you can have is understanding the question. Right. Particularly the behavior. Yeah, I agree. And I think that there's a lot of people that rush into keeping and there's a lot of people that get one snake and kind of get the bug and they get tons of snakes and they get different stuff. And sometimes they want to jump into venomous or pythons. And I personally feel that oh, I, there's so much knowledge out there that you can get for free now. I think people should read books, watch videos, talk to people, do a lot of research because ex- people don't understand that exotic animals need specialized care. Even if it's just a ball python, that really they need specialized care because I mean, some people live in an environment that's like Africa here in the U S but keeping an exotic animal in captivity is different from keeping a domestic animal, keeping a reptile is different from keeping a mammal. So I think people should do more research and um, before keeping venomous, I feel like people should find a mentor and um, work with somebody and watch somebody, watch somebody first, observe them, spend time with them, clean cages. Um, I believe that, first of all, I don't believe that the government should be in charge of these decisions. I think, I think like herpetologists should be the ones making the decisions about the laws and things like that. Um, and I do believe that we should have our freedom because I don't think that some Congress person who just wants to take our money should be the one making these decisions. But um, I believe that um, a lot of people get into venomous prematurely and they often don't do it respectfully. And I also, too, think especially when you're starting out, 
that uh, working with baby animals and getting to know the animal and getting them to know you uh, when they're smaller and more manageable is definitely a smart thing to do. I'm not saying that, um, you know, I, I know someone that their first venomous snake was a large gaboon viper and they were okay, but they also approached it. They were obsessed. They read everything they could about it. They learned as much as they could about it and they approached it respectfully. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, with any of that stuff, the more you, I see a lot of like younger people, particularly like flea handling snakes, some in which they caught. And when I, if I say, I can't say anything about the handle from free health science my whole life, but not like most everybody else does. Back when it, it, it's more like I understood them enough that I could do it without getting bit by them. You know, I mean, I could get any model of cobra out of a box or cage without hooking any kind, safer than most people do it with them. But by going because of understanding them, and what we do is, is we simply manipulate them to do what we want them to do by using their behavior against them. But the problem is, if you're 25 years old and you caught the copper a year ago, how the hell is that going to happen? You know what I mean? And I see this, and I see people with cobras, and, and honestly, it's just it's, it's kind of a stupid thing to do because the same people are the ones that have escapes and. Honestly, the, the public doesn't care about us that much. Right. They care when shit gets loose that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. They care about that. And right. That's what causes a lot of loss of the past. Right. For real. Uh, and, and free handling, too. Let's explain what free handling is. There's two kinds of free handling. Okay, one is free handling the snake without tools, but not trusting the snake not to bite you. You just are good enough you can handle it. It, it can't bite you. Right. You're not let it bite you. You're not going to allow it to bite you. But the other time is free handling where you're trusting the snake not to bite you. <clears throat> I would recommend never to do that. Mm -hmm. And I've only ever done that with like one or two snakes in my entire life. One of them is the giant main shed viper I have here now, May May. I had her since she hatched. She's 14 years old this year. She's eight feet long. She was just, I'm going to be honest with you, she had lost her fear of human beings. I've done research and experiment after experiment. No human being of any size scares her. Hmm. But, but if you show her a, 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 a dog, a cat, a pig, a chicken, or a peacock, and these are the things I've used, animals, if you show her that through the glass, or when we used to take her in the yard and crawl around in the yard, she'll turn into a fertilizer by your feet. Swell up, vibrate her tail, and, and if the animal comes close, she will kill it. Wow. She pay no attention to you. You can be standing right there. She's not targeting you. She's not going to bite you. <laughs> Pick her up. She's not going to bite you. She's not. It's the it's the threat. So they're not like, uh, uh, I, I don't want to say that they're smarter as monkeys or anything like that, but they're a lot smarter than what we all think. And mm -hmm. so they, they I, I mean, for me to, to, to actually believe that a snake that has a preconceived uh, DNA to respond to, to, to ectotherm, big ectothermic animals, she, she is inclined to, I mean, she was born to defend against that. Mm -hmm. that in her short life, she's learned that at least one kind of warm-blooded animal is not a threat. That's a human. Because humans have no reaction at all. It's like they're not there at all. So you just don't care. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, as we talked about earlier, there are animals that are certainly highly intelligent. Yeah. And so, uh, like uh, you're saying, uh, she can differentiate what she can perceives as yeah. a threat versus mm -hmm. this is my caretaker or at least a non-threatening animal or person. Um, so I was wondering mm -hmm. if you've read, read the book uh, by Jenny Smith, uh, Stolen World. I have. I was I wondering what you thought about it. Well, so, I, I, I was all for the book at first, and I knew Jenny well. I actually got to her yeah. one of my collecting expeditions to the Dominican Republic. Uh -huh. The problem with the book, once it came out, it wasn't factual. Okay. So I had a problem with the book. If, if the, like, like uh, the Lizard King was factual pretty much, and it was a good book by... Yes, that, the Lizard Kings also. Yeah, I have that book yeah, as well. But, but she kind of like, it could have been better than it was if she hadn't just, basically what she did, she spent most of her time with Hank Hall. 
I didn't spend much time with her. I took her to the, I let her go to the Mexican Republic at that one time um, mm-hmm. a while ago. And uh, I talked to her at a reptile show, but for a couple of years, I hung around with Hank. And basically, those are all stories from Hank Moult, even about other people. It's a, more, more of a narrative from Hank than mm-hmm. actually, actually, not just about okay. me, but other people too. So I wasn't fond of that book because of that. So those were those were anecdotes about you and yeah. Hank and other people told secondhand to Jenny. Well, no, that- it was stuff told by Hank to Jenny. Oh, okay, by Hank about her, other people. Correct. Okay. Correct. Because it, I know it was, it was almost all a Hank Mole narrative, and if you know anybody who knows Hank Mole, all you have to do is ask him. You don't understand why that. I mean, it's true. I'm not. I know. I know that Jenny prided herself on doing a lot of research and finding records, and basically saying that everything in the book was corroborated by some type of evidence. So, are you well, saying that part, that's not the, the case? Part, I'm saying it's not true. Read the part about me going to Sri Lanka out of the blue and haranguing the people until they gave me sightings permits. Which, in fact, before I went to Sri Lanka, we had telex machines in those days. Uh, Lindy Alves, the director of the zoo in Tehuela, who was also the sire of the sightings, asked, he said they had no money at the zoo, but they wanted one of the original albino Burmese pythons. It was that long ago, in the early 80s. <laughs> and I said, well, I can hook you up that <clears throat> for $15,000. It cost me 7000 each you know, at that time. Three. And I had sold one to Bob already, Park. And, uh, uh-huh. So I, I shipped it to it. And uh, in about a month, I flew over there, and he let me have part one. Any animals from Sri Lanka, pretty much I wanted. And uh, I went out, he let me go collect wild ones. God, what a time. I spent, uh, I spent three days in the big national park with about two wild elephants. So I saw Sri Lankan pythons and all kinds of stuff. Uh, what an experience. But to think you could go to another whole country and, and aggravate them until they gave you permits is kind of stupid. And certainly it's not true. Mm-hmm. That's just one. Interesting. So um, a lot of them are, are, are stuff like that. Really what she did more than anything else is she wrote it in, in a very sardonic manner. Mm-hmm. Let me explain to you. I, I used to have a friend that had tattoos all the way up here, his whole body all the way down here, but in a suit you couldn't see him kind of. You know what I mean? So he was here on vacation. Mm-hmm. And he and if Jenny had seen him, he tripped over something here, I would write, my friend from the UK tripped over the the, the floor. She mm-hmm. would write, tattoo thug from the UK, who might possibly be a skinhead, tripped over the, the, the thing. You see the difference in how it's written about the same right. thing? That's the problem. Yeah, it certainly vilified some of the people, you know, I mean, dramatized, you could say. She dramatized. dramatized. Yes, which, I mean, it's been a popular book. And unfortunately, books that just plainly state the facts, people find less entertaining. Um, the book was very exciting to read. Right. No, I understand that. It's just, it is what it is. Yes. I totally understand that. So uh, who may I ask else in the book? For example, Hank, were you personal acquaintances or friends with? I have Colette Harrison. I could go on and on and on. I mean, everybody in the book. Well, tell me about Hank, if you don't mind. I, I don't want to get on here and just talk about people or anything. It's not my favorite person, but that's pretty much that. I mean, ask, ask anybody. I'm happy to ask anybody. <laughs> All right. Um, so I would like to know uh, what you can share with us about breeding reticulated pythons. What do you mean breeding? Breeding. Okay. Breeding retics. Oh, well, they're actually pretty easy to breed. It's just to put them together for the most part. I mean, I found them really easy to breed. Uh, I mean, they're easy to breed no matter what you do or how you keep them, really, pretty much. Um, uh, just don't put males together, I can tell you that. Maybe oh, yeah. Them, but otherwise, and, it, and it's a snake, too, that the eggs are much easier to hatch, say, than a, a python or a pythonotus, or even an African wild. Um, uh, the eggs are 
real into the hatch, of course, the piping goes. Um, I mean, it's an animal that lends itself to open cause from south to side. I mean, it's great, but you, you just keeping them out of them is a problem. Mm -hmm. For anything that gets 20 feet long, what do you do? I mean, damn, it takes a little room for something like that. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. And not everybody has outside, even if you do inside, how much space inside unless you're going to have a little house for you kids. You know, there's a guy in Europe that's really doing them right in the UK named Dougie. I don't know if you've seen it or not. Hmm. He's got a huge albino tick, but he's got this cage that's like 30 feet long and inside of his house, it's beautiful, like a zoo. Like habitat, and he lets the snake out. The snake is intelligent, comes out on song, cross pulls up on the couch, and so forth with the family. Uh, I mean, retakes are retakes are super intelligent, the snake. Mm -hmm. and that's why I feel so bad for them because they know when they're not being treated well, right? They understand they have feelings, just maybe not exactly like you and I do, but they have them, and they honor people and they love them. Mm -hmm. They definitely know one person. Mm -hmm. But not just them, pretty much all reptiles, but they're all sentient beings, all reptiles. Are. Yeah, I agree. And I think they can even like sense your energy. Um, you know, if someone's nervous or afraid, it's going to make the animal nervous. And I've had a lot of people who say, Oh, okay. We had one guy that worked for us that everything would bite him. And I mean, it was kind of a running joke because he would open an enclosure and something would jump out, you know, ball pythons or green tree pie, anything would bite him. I have no idea what's going on. I, exactly. I, there's nothing would happen at all. Nothing. It's all about what you do. Because mm -hmm. how the handler handles dictates how the cat behaves. And how the cat behaves should dictate how the handler handles. Unfortunately, that's not the case because the cat keeper has no idea how the handler will start with. Yes, I agree. That's why one reason why experience and respect are super important. But it wasn't that that captive bird stuff like people have around now. This was a jungle female with a head about a foot long. Maybe it's a telephone book. Hey, a book, a telephone book, and probably weighed up. 190 pounds, like my tick, but it's much older and it's much thinner. The length of it, you know, all the mm -hmm. same length as the one I have. And uh, I told him, don't mess with that. That's not like what you think. He used to have that mm -hmm. big job for me, his name, baby. And uh, he did. He went in there and she caught him. She killed him. Mm -hmm. And the guy with him there started stabbing her to try to get him off. That killed her. Stabbing, but not them. So the paramedics got there shot the snake, you know, with the uh, uh -huh. information. Got blew away from the snake, because that made the snake run when they did that. Mm -hmm. And then they had to restart Lou's heart. He tells the whole story. It's on Oprah Winfrey if you want to read it, but I sent him mm -hmm. that. That's the difference in a jungle snake and that shit that's produced here now. The problem with the retics in the U.S. now, too, none of them live much more than about 15 years. That's the biggest thing. They get real big and then they die because... Basically, they don't have enough exercise in their bed too much. Right. They get physiological problems and health. We take the nation probably been 40 to 50 years at least, maybe more. Wow. Uh, they until they die. Um, they live in the same place pretty much their whole life. Uh, they have the same snakes they come in co contact with. And more importantly, they have a primate to eat psychology. They eat primates. One of the problems in... Uh, Got an Anton at the Jang Ping Reserve with the orangutans, but they had to make the tick prove orang cages. So the ticks going there with half grown orangutans and kill and eat them and then not be able to get back through the bars. You know, hmm. like 50 60 pound orangutans. So if you think, I mean, a snake like I had here or like that one we had, that would kill you so fast. Now, that every tick we had is the most dangerous snake we had here. And keep in mind, I have pink coats. So. Wow. So um, I I worry that because retics are good eaters and because people think it's fun to watch them eat, a lot of people have obese retics, retics well, that are shortening their lives. Pretty much 80% of people do it more. And it's not just retics. It's more and everything else. And then people right. say, BCI get like eight people. 
shit, they get 12 or 15 feet long. I've got a BCI out there now. It's 11 feet long. It's going to have probably 75 babies. She's wow. 24 years old. She's 24 years old, not 12 years old. That's the difference. You know, uh, it's just a matter of just not overfeeding it and letting it exercise. Let me put right. it to you way. If you and I or anybody would be locked in a closet, we would eat, we would live, we would. If you put a mate in there for us, we certainly would breathe. Nothing else to do in there. That's what the snakes do. Because breathing, mm -hmm. breathing anything is not a big thing to go by how good you are because that's a basic biological urge that happens if a life supports you. It's not a complex thing. Mm -hmm. It's a thing that's natural. But the getting them to not be afraid of you, that's a completely different thing. That's mm -hmm. different. So anyway, these re re texts are nothing to play with. I mean, and I see these people eight or nine foot ticks and put them around your neck. But you do that and there's nobody there and you start moving around the snake starts to you don't right. want to fall, so it'll tighten up. That's how the lady got killed here not long ago. Mm -hmm. And then you start to try to get it off, and when you try to get it off, you're scared, so you do it rough. The rougher you are, the tighter the snake squeezes. In 12 to 20 seconds, and the blood's cut off, you're going to go down. Once you're right. down, there's nobody there, you're going to die. Because mm -hmm. if you kick around, that snake's going to squeeze harder and harder because you mm -hmm. get scared. But they don't, I shouldn't say that, but people just don't stop to think about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And it's scary, and that's killing. It's going to destroy the hobby for everybody on the planet. We're our own worst enemies, just to let you know. We are. And I'm as guilty as anybody, as I have learned, I've evolved, but we keep too much stuff. We, we not only keep too many animals of all kinds. I, you know, I've downsized here 50% in mm -hmm. just the last few years and going down even more. Uh, and I'm glad, and because it benefits really both the keeper and the cat. Because when you spend a lot more time with your individual animals, you get so much more out of them. You get way right. more back than you ever spend. You really do. And your understanding goes up astronomically. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I mean, we can learn maybe more from the animals than oh. I think they learn from us. It's so, it's been um, about so, an hour, so I'm not going to be able <laughs> to go too, too much longer. But okay, let me. Let me ask you one more question. Uh, you've been amazing, by the way. Um, so somebody told me that Sulawesi retics have a strong tendency to be egg bound when they become gravid. Is that been your experience? Uh, not. I've never tried to breed Sulawesi retics. You know, the retics that I bred was just calico retics way back when we didn't know. Mm. The which I bred, by the way. I brought in the first one and bred them mm -hmm. back in the 80s. And they all had babies that looked normal. Hmm. So I thought, well, shit, it's not genetic. So I saw yeah. all the babies. And, uh, and I exported the big ones. <laughs> That's a true story. I don't think <laughs> so. Well, I want to thank well, you I so much. Know, I, I, I really think that if, if they have a tendency to hold the eggs and you're saying it's Sulawesi, it's not. And the reason it's Sulawesi is they have a, they average a little bigger size than other pigs. Uh, and kept in the same cages, they would get egg bound simply because they can't freaking stretch out. Mm. Of course, they're okay. going to get egg turned sideways. If you put them in a room, that probably will never happen. But if mm. you put it in an eight foot vision cage and it's 16 feet long, it right. might happen. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on tonight. You've been absolutely amazing. Everybody's loved hearing you visit. Um, thank you, Stacy, for helping us get logged in and everything. Thank you. And I'm glad you're feeling better. And I'm just so honored to be your friend. Well, it's my pleasure to, to, to see you. You have beautiful Sulawesi retakes, for sure. I saw the picture. Yes, thank you so much. All right, everybody, thank you for joining us tonight. This was Tom Crutchfield and signing off. See signing you guys, off. everybody, have a great Sunday and a happy spring. See you later.